Hello and welcome to the lecture on the senses. So we're just going to go through the special senses produced by the human nervous system. By no means are we doing a nice little exhaustive thing, but hopefully we have some fun. So first off, let's talk about the senses because everybody knows the five senses, right? Good old sight, scent, touch, Ooh, what else? Taste. Mm, hearing. Oh. Wait, is that it? No, 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 no. There's more than five senses. And just for a taste, there's pain, there's pressure, there's temperature, there's hunger, there's movement, there's muscle position, and even my favorite, most favorite category, other. And let's start with the ones that are easiest to talk about. First off is pain as a sense. So pain is an alarm sense. Uh, so when you have pain, it is an alarm indicating that there is damage. So damage to the body is pain. So you have free loose nerve endings. So if this is your, you know, finger, it was your fingernail. There we go. So you've got loose nerve endings in there. Let's, uh, let's make those loose nerve endings blue because I'm feeling whimsical. So you've got these ner nerve endings and you just have the parts that end up sending the impulses have loose axons near the surface of the skin. And all you need to activate those is some form of damage. Oh no! <laughs> ah. When something hits those nerve endings, it registers as damage and it sends an impulse and your brain translates that impulse as pain, an alarm system for pain. Like I said, loose nerve endings in the skin. The special term for these pain receptors is the nociceptor. The nociceptor is the term for these loose nerve endings that generate pain. Uh, so it's worth noting that I emphasize the alarm system bit a lot because even very simple creatures have those loose nerve endings. Something like a little planarian. Right? It has a couple of eye spots and it will have some loose nerve endings for pain. But it's not feeling pain. Right? It may have these loose nerve endings, but it's certainly not feeling pain in the way you or I feel pain because the brain of a planarian is basically a couple of nerves connecting up to these little eye spots that sense the presence of light. So these connect up to its nervous system, but by no means is it generating a complex emotional behavioral response. It generates a reflexive movement away from the pain. So pain is an alarm system, but it takes a particularly well-developed brain like a mammalian brain to what we call appreciate pain. So the big thing when people talk about cruelty is whether or not an organism appreciates pain. In other words, whether or not they have an emotional appreciation of pain. And it gets sort of wacky as to whether or not that's happening, right? Uh, because it's really hard to register emotions in animals because they can't tell you how they're feeling. So you develop sort of an external idea of what an animal displays on the outside when it is experiencing something analogous to a human emotion. So. Temperature, another easy one. So, these are called thermoreceptors. 
right? And thermal receptors come in two basic flavors, right? You have thermal receptors that are detecting temperature below body temperature. And what would you call the sensation of a temperature below body temperature? Anybody want to guess? Gee, I wonder if it has anything to do with the color I just used. Yes, the thermal receptors that detect temperatures below body temperature are our cold temperature thermal receptors. Whereas the thermal receptors that detect above body temperature are, of course, the thermal receptors associated with hot temperatures, right? So if whatever you are in contact with is, even if it's the air, if it's below your body temperature, you will translate that information as cold. If the nerves being activated are the ones that detect temperatures below body temperature, you will interpret cold. If the nerves being activated are the ones that detect temperatures above body temperature, you will interpret it as hot. Now, what's interesting, uh, what I find especially interesting, is if you come into contact with something at body temperature, like something exactly at body temperature, you will essentially get no temperature informa information to your brain. Uh, it will feel like what it feels like to the touch um, or the pressure associated with it, but you won't really get any temperature information, which is really fascinating. It will feel kind of like nothing. So if you have a chance, go ahead and mess with your sink. Turn the heat on, turn the cold on, and find the right combination that gets to your body temperature. Um, lukewarm is near there, but still above. Get to your body temperature and you will not receive any temperature information. It's really cool. Now, there is, right, a third type of thermoreceptor, right? We have cold, we have hot, and then we've got dangerous or damaging temperatures. So these are a lot like the alarm, the damage alarms. In fact, what we call them is thermal nociceptors. So a thermal nociceptor being a nociceptor is detecting damage. It's an alarm signal, it is detecting damage. Right? A paper cut can damage you, and extreme heat or cold can damage you. Heat tends to get to you just a little faster than cold, because your brain can overheat a lot faster than it can die of cold. Um, but the neat thing about this is that there's no information in a thermal nociceptor about body temperature. So you don't get any information, right? The thermal nociceptor, when activated, has no info on whether or not it's hot or cold. It will feel the same. It will activate. It will not feel the same, but it will activate the same whether it's a damaging cold temperature or a damaging hot temperature. So what's really fascinating about this uh, what I really love about this the most is that that temperature information, hot and cold, is delivered by the context of the situation, right? Your other senses. So it's those other senses that will give you the information as to whether it's hot or cold. Humans are incredibly biased towards sight. So we will take visual information 
uh, in order to determine whether it's hot or cold, right? So there's visual information and there's often a hearing component, right? Because remember, something that's very hot will pop and crackle in the heat, especially if you've got oil in a pan, right? So uh, what I love the most about this very fact is that if you mess with the context, you can alter whether or not your brain is determining that damage as hot damage or cold damage, right? So if you just hold on to an ice cube for a little bit, it will start to activate your thermal nociceptors. So if you grab an ice cube and you're holding it, you will feel a bunch of cold, right? But a neat trick, if you've got a car that has a heater that, you know, runs real hot, if you grab an ice cube and turn that heater on full blast running at a really painfully hot temperature and then put the back of your hand against that heater air, uh, you will very quickly translate the information of those nociceptors into burning. And you'll feel like your hand is burning. You will know that you put an ice cube in there, but once you change the context, once you, you know, start getting that extreme heat going on the back of your hand, you'll start to interpret it as burning. There's a classic thing where if you get someone to blindfold themselves uh, and then just light a match, right? They'll hear the match go off and blow it out and they'll smell the sulfur and maybe a little bit of that smoke and then light another match and blow it out and light another match and blow it out and then light a match touch their skin with an ice cube and they will feel burning right your brain is heavily context dependent on what it interprets these temperatures as uh, so I highly recommend messing with your thermoceptors, especially your thermal nociceptors. There's a lot of things you can do. I have uh, gotten a pan, a skillet, and put a little bit of oil in my skillet and got it popping and then put a frozen chicken breast in there and then it really started popping. And then uh, once it calmed down enough that I could get near without getting burned with hot oil, uh, but was by no means defrosted, stuck my finger on that top part that hasn't been in the oil and is frozen and I immediately started to feel my finger burning because all the info from the pan and the oil said hot. Very cool. So you have the above body temperature thermal receptors and below body temperature thermal receptors and then you have your thermal nociceptors. Okay, let's move on to touch. Touch is another interesting one. Touch is actually sort of a combination of different things. Uh, you have pressure, which can be either light pressure or deep pressure, right? So light pressure, if I run my finger over this stylus here, I'm getting some light <laughs> pressure information. Deep pressure is when I grab it and I push, and then I'm getting deep pressure information. And then there's another bit of info that comes from stretch, right? As I run my finger along here, it stretches the skin, even if ever so subtly, right? So the smoothness of something can be determined with how much it stretches your skin, right? This, this part of my stylus is shiny and very smooth, and it's going to do very little stretching of my skin as I pass my fingers over. So very cool. This part is more rubbery, and it causes some of that skin to catch, and so it stretches a little bit. So even when I'm putting just about equal pressure on that, I'm getting different stretch information. So that's pretty cool. So your pressure, comes from mechanoreceptors, right? So you're either going to have, for light pressure, surface mechanoreceptors, and for deep pressure, you're going to have deep mechanoreceptors, amazingly enough. 
right? So if you look at the skin, right? Here's that fingertip again. There's my fingernail. Right there we go. Because your fingers are one of the main things we get our information from. Those light mechanoreceptors are going to be very close to the surface of your skin. Very close. Because they're responsible for getting that information about the light touch. And then you're going to have your deep mechanoreceptors, which are further in. So we have our deep pressure receptors and we have our light pressure receptors. And then also embedded along in your skin will be the little stretch receptors, which are going to give you information on how that skin is reacting to the surface. So these are all different kinds of mechanoreceptors. We have pressure mechanoreceptors and we have stretch mechanoreceptors. Very cool. So your pressure stuff are very close to the surface for light touch and deeper for more harder pressure information. So that's pretty cool. Hunger is another important sensation you need to feel, right? So if you've got your stomach, let's just get our sort of commas stomach right there. It is a three dimensional structure and you'll have these sort of bands around the stomach of little stretch receptors. So these are stretch mechanoreceptors. And basically, if your stomach is empty, wow, all right, they're not detecting much stretch. But if you fill your stomach up an awful lot, they detect a lot of stretch. Now, um, these are internal nerves. And the thing about internal nerves, nerves associated with your internal organs, is that uh, you have much fewer of them than you have at the body surface, right? So you have tons of surface nerves, especially when you get to the appendages most associated with sensory information. Like in humans, our fingertips give us tons of information. Our palms give us some good information, right? So uh, we're gonna have tons and tons of nerves up in here, a little fewer on our palms, a little fewer on our arms. But when you get into the internal body cavity, you've got much fewer nerves and you have less, how do I put it, precise information coming from those nerves, right? So for instance, internal nociceptors are few and far between. So what you get when you have damage internally is referred pain. Uh, referred pain is where pain associated with a certain structure or organ uh, is not well detected and so your body translates that into pain at the surface, right? So for instance, if you get damage to the heart, you'll often feel that in your arm and shoulder, right? Your arm is nowhere near the heart, but the pain is being referred there, right? You're getting an alarm, but there's not enough really good location information inside your body. So that damage alarm is going off and it's just sent to where you have decent sensory information coming from. So hunger receptors can lie to you because you don't get really precise info on that stomach stretch. You'll know when you're very hungry, but as it fills up, 
you're not going to get like instant, really precise, updated information on that. So you can end up feeling hungry while your stomach is quite full. So you have those stretch mechanoreceptors. Another very cool one is movement and muscle position done by a certain set of nerves called proprioceptors. So proprioceptors are pretty sweet. Proprioceptors detect contraction of muscles, right? And they also detect joint position. So basically, if I try and take my finger here and I bend it in such a way where I'm not touching anything else. Like if I bend it here, I'm touching another part of my hand. That's going to give me information. So if I bend it a little like that, uh, I'm not going to get any touch information about it being bent. Uh, and so my context here is going to come from proprioception, especially if I take away my vision. So if I take away my vision uh, and then do something else, like maybe this, I could draw what's happening to my hand. I know what's happening with my fingers. I could draw this and this and that. I could draw this. I know where that is. And what's happening is that when I bend fingers, right, there are muscles uh, that are contracting tendons. So there are muscles here that are contracting and pulling on the tendons, allowing those fingers to move. And there are proprioceptors in that muscle detecting that contraction. And then up here at the finger joints, there are proprioceptors detecting movement of the joint. So even though I'm not getting visual information, right, uh, I know what I am doing here because of those proprioceptors. So that's pretty sweet. Uh, so those are proprioceptors, um, and they detect information and your brain is what puts that information together. I know what's going on with my fingers due to visualization, right? I visualize that information. My brain is taking those nerve firings and it's translating it so that while I don't have any other good information, I can visualize where my fingers are and what my hand looks like. And that's all brain stuff combining sensory information to give myself uh, knowledge, even though I can't confirm through hearing, sight, or any of the, the touch, the big, big human biased senses, right? We're, we're heavily biased towards sight, touch, and a little bit of hearing. Those are our big biases, right? Smell, okay. Uh, hearing, a little more important, but touch and sight, that's our humongous ones. So that's kind of cool. So, proprioceptors. Okay, moving along to our first of the big five, right? The ones you think of when you say the senses. And that one is scent. Okay, so scent is based on chemoreceptors chemoceptors or chemoreceptors, however you want to write that. This is a very vague uh, term. Chemoreceptors. A very vague term. Because a chemoreceptor binds to specific chemicals. A chemical is anything made of atoms. You put some atoms together and you have a chemical. So chemoreceptors bind to specific chemicals and when they bind to a specific chemicals, uh, to a specific chemical, it causes that nerve impulse to travel to the brain. So 
Um, it's the brain that translates that into the information you get. Um, so what's interesting is that related chemicals can trigger the same response. Uh, so for instance, if you smell vanilla, right, um, just from the grocery store, get some genuine Madagascar vanilla if you want to be fancy and smell it. And then if you ever happen to be outside by a ponderosa pine, scratch and sniff the bark, right? Get a little bit of scratching on that bark or find a location with some fresh sap and smell it. And it will trigger the same receptors that you trigger for vanilla. And it will smell like vanilla because it's your brain that first translated that into vanilla. In fact, if you had been raised up in the mountain forests and, you know, someone was mean to you and never used any vanilla in cooking, and all you knew that smell from was ponderosa pines, when you were first, when you finally get introduced to vanilla, you'll be like, oh, that smells like ponderosa pines, because <laughs> your brain has made the uh, connection between those chemicals and what it is to you. So, uh, the sensation of scent is termed olfaction. So, these, uh, this is your olfactory system. Right, and so basically how it works is you have the nose, right, and then, uh, see, there's your head, there you go. Inside the nose, we lead to the nasal cavity, right, well, there's our nasal cavity, and it connects up at the throat, right, and there's some little bony turbinate bones. Who cares what the names of those are? But right at the roof of the nasal cavity is where you have your olfactory chemoreceptors. So again, I use the word olfactory chemoreceptors because chemo is such a broad term. These are the olfactory chemoreceptors. And they're just at the roof of the nasal cavity. Uh, what's cool about this is that there's relatively thin bone here at the roof of the nasal cavity. And so, uh, basically, that nasal information, uh, this is an excellent drawing, my brain is looking extremely squashed. But anyway, sure. That, uh, those nasal chemoreceptors, those olfactory chemoreceptors, just sort of connect right through the plate in that skull and right to the brain. So, uh, you're gonna translate that olfactory information pretty quick once you receive it. So, you smell someone coming from a mile away, huh? <laughs> oh, anyway. Uh, so, olfactory chemoreceptors, uh, they bind to specific chemicals and generate a nerve impulse. Humans have relatively, uh, I'm gonna put a low numbers of different chemoreceptors, low diversity, it's still quite a lot. Like we can still determine in thousands of odors. Uh, but basically, the uh, chemoreceptors are specific to a chemical or class of chemicals. And the more different chemoreceptors you have, the more olfactory information you can get. That's why, you know, a human can smell a specific number of scents, and then, like, a bloodhound has so much better smell because they've got a much greater diversity of olfactory nerves. So like I said, sends this information right through that itty bitty plate at the top of the nasal cavity, straight to the brain, translate that information into the smells that you have learned, right? Uh, humans have a thousand or more uh, diverse olfactory chemoreceptors 
Sounds like a lot, not a ton compared to a lot of other animals. Uh, olfactory chemoreceptors are very similar to taste. Um, you get a lot of cross-reactivity uh, when it comes to the uh, chemoreceptors involved in taste and the chemoreceptors involved in smell. And we'll talk about that. Right now in taste, your sense of taste is gustation. So you are getting gustatory information from your taste receptors. So what's that thing that has all the taste receptors? Oh, I'm forgetting. Oh man, it's like, it's also a word uh, that's associated with like a bassoon, I think maybe. Oh, uh, hmm. Mm. I just can't think of it. Uh, no, it's all located in chemoreceptors in your tongue. So there's a, a tongue. There's some connective tissue. Right there it is going to the back of the throat. There's my big tongue attaching down there. Uh, so here's my big old human tongue. And that human tongue, right, it has these little pits. All over it are teeny tiny little pits that open up into a little bitty cavity. And inside that little bitty cavity are the gustatory chemoreceptors. The gustatory chemoreceptors. So, the inside those pits are where you're going to pick up your taste information. You're going to have like a bunch of little nerves inside each pit, but I am not going to draw a ton of nerves. This picture here has a decent number of, uh, of cells in there, so they're representing it okay. But I wanted to put the tongue on there, man. So you have the gustatory chemoreceptors um, on the tongue in pits. And so the big thing here is that you need saliva. You need saliva. Taste requires saliva because saliva is our liquid right solvent and something has to be the chemicals that you taste have to be dissolved into your saliva in order to actually pass into the pits if your tongue is dry like if you take your tongue out and hold it like this right and you hold your tongue for a while outside your mouth and let it dry out what you can do is take that take things with strong tastes uh, and poke them on your tongue. You'll probably get some information from your sense of smell, but you're not going to get taste information because you've dried out your tongue and there's no saliva dissolving to carry those chemicals to your gustatory chemoreceptors. All right, so you need those chemicals to dissolve in saliva before they can get inside the gustation pits and trigger those impulses. Uh, so, intensity of flavor, right? Flavor intensity is determined by a few things, right? It's the number of receptors activated, both in a pit and across all pits. The more receptors in different pits activated, the stronger the flavor. The more receptors in your pits activated, the stronger the flavor. So that's an obvious one, right? The number of receptors activated. Uh, another one is how long the chemicals 
stay bound. Right, the binding strength between the chemicals and the receptors. Uh, a much stronger binding chemical will stay on the receptor longer and keep activating it over and over and over again. It's long, as long as it's bound to the receptor, as long as it's bound to that nerve, uh, it will continuously activate that nerve. And so you will continue to get that taste information. Right? So the intensity is determined by the number of receptors activated and how long those chemicals stay bound. And I like to mention artificial sweeteners because it's kind of neat. See, an artificial sweetener uh, is extremely strong in its intensity, but not due to the amount of artificial sweetener in there. Artificial sweeteners in a package have a very low number of actual molecules, right? So when you get that package of Splenda and tear it open, most of it is something like dextrose, some inert chemical that's safe to eat. Um, so uh, whatever it is, dextrose, cornstarch, something. Uh, just something that doesn't activate anything, really. Doesn't have a flavor. And there's a, a comparatively extremely small amount of actual artificial sweetener chemicals. And this is because the intensity of an artificial sweetener comes entirely, almost entirely, from how long the chemicals stay bound to your receptors. Right? Artificial sweeteners bind very strong to your gustatory chemoreceptors and they stay bound for quite a while. Uh, so if you drink some soda, uh, you'll get that sweetness and it'll pass. And then if you drink some artificially sweetened soda, you'll get that flavor effect for a bit longer. So uh, if they pumped up the number of artificial sweetener molecules in those packages, uh, so that like the package was full of actual Splenda, um, you might throw up due to the sweetness. The intensity would be so strong that you couldn't handle it. So that's kind of cool. Important note, there are no taste zones. None. No. No taste zones. This was an idea thought up by some kind of German guy, I think. Uh, I don't know, maybe not German. I'm just hypothesizing out of my rectum on that one. Let's ignore that I just said some German guy. Uh, some scientists thought up uh, taste zones where you have your tongue right and there's the front of your tongue and there's the back of your tongue and it had some really annoying stuff in there don't draw this this is wrong but he had like identified that the zone at the front was for sweet and the zone at the back is where you get bitter information and you have like sour information from the middle of the tongue yeah, there's your sour, and, and he could come up with this whole bunch of different taste zones where the different gustatory chemoreceptors are, and people kind of accepted it, and it turned out to be 100% true, uh, false. Wow, I went to say false, and my brain was like, hey, you want to say true? I was like, no, not particularly brain, and it was like, you know what, let's go with true. Because you were just implying that it's not true. Let's just confuse everyone. Thanks, Brian. Mm. Appreciate it. It's 100% false. These uh, gustatory chemoreceptors are sort of distributed evenly along your tongue. Um, who knows why this guy carefully came up with taste zones. It might have been due to reflexes that you, like, if you taste something bitter, you swallow it as quickly as possible and so it spends more time in the back of your throat. Maybe that's why he thought bitter is tasted at the back. Who knows? Not alive, so we can't interview him. Uh, so, taste receptors are kind of cool. We divide them into sort of different categories. Sweet taste receptors respond to sugars. Uh, 
various types of sugars, anything that ends in os. <laughs> Glucose, fructose, uh, and, and different sugars will actually cause different um, intensity responses. Fructose causes a greater intensity response. Fructose tastes sweeter than glucose. So if you want something kind of fun, like if you get some caro corn syrup, this is not an advertisement, this is just fun uh, with tongue. So caro corn syrup is glucose. It's 100% glucose isolated from corn. Uh, so if you get that syrup, it is <laughs> glucose. And then you get some standard like artificial syrup. Uh, there's a lot of fructose in it because uh, it's high fructose corn syrup. Very different. High fructose corn syrup is uh, more than 50% uh, 50 fructose, right? It's a solution of fructose and glucose, and more than 50% of that solution comes from fructose. That's why it's high fructose. Anyway, high fructose corn syrup will taste much sweeter than your caro corn syrup, and that's because the caro corn syrup is glucose only. Try it. Kind of neat. Uh, so, sweet receptors, the sweet receptors detect sugars. Sourness is a acid detector, right? It detects acidity, so the sour receptors bind to protons. You may have to go all the way back to the dregs of your memory near the beginning of the semester when we talked about acids. Right? The strength of an acid is based entirely on the amount of protons in the solution. So when you taste something and there happens to be a bunch of protons in there, like sour candies or something, uh, you're going to get a sourness out of it. Saltiness, right, are sodium receptors. There's an entire class of uh, things that are salts, al alkali salts. I don't know what they're called but there's an entire class of chemicals that are salts. Um, so they're often uh, bonded to chlorine, right? So, you know, sodium chloride is table salt. Uh, there's MG, uh, what is it, CL, uh, MgCl2, or is it Cl2, Mg, I don't know, anyway. There's a lot of different salts out there. So salts will bind to your tongue. Different salt compounds will produce different flavor profiles. Bitterness is an interesting one. Uh, so rather than a class of atoms, um, class of macromolecules, bitterness is actually a alarm system. So bitterness is associated with poisons. So uh, it's, it's a poison detection system. So, remember, venom is injected into your body. Poison is sort of secreted, right? You have to touch or swallow a poison, right? Uh, poison dart frogs are poisonous because you have to rub them on you or swallow them to actually get the toxic concentration of chemicals involved. Whereas a snake is venomous because it has to use its fangs to bite you and inject its venom. Anyway, bitterness uh, <laughs> detects toxic compounds, compounds that uh, can become toxic in relatively low concentration, like uh, a lot of alcohols. Mm -hmm. Bitter. Interesting. Uh, and then another one um, that we refer to as umami. Uh, this is savory and meaty flavors. So like broths, right? Uh, meats, these savory flavors. So it's a wide variety of chemicals. There are savory mushrooms. There's savory herbs and vegetables. 
Uh, so things that have sort of a savory, meaty flavor are detected by your umami chemo, uh, umami gustatory chemo receptors. There, I was real fancy with that one. Okay, let's mention taste and smell. So, the chemicals that activate taste are odorants, right? Odorants can very easily bind to, odorants can trigger gustatory chemoreceptors and uh, I don't even know what the converse word for odorant is, but whatever, taste chemicals, tasty chemicals can trigger olfactory chemoreceptors. There's a ton of overlap or cross reactivity when it comes to gustation and olfaction. When you smell something really bad, you'll be like, oh, 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 I can taste it. Oh, oh I, uh, even though you didn't like eat it, right, you didn't throw that in your mouth and dissolve it in your saliva. Uh, when you inhale to get that smell, that air will travel right through your nasal cavity to the back to the throat, the nasopharynx, and connects up to the oral, uh, the, the pharynx associated with your um, oral cavity, and it, that air carrying those chemicals will pass over your tongue. And if you've got a little bit of saliva, even though it's just little odorant chemicals, it'll trigger your taste receptors when it dissolves in the saliva. And so you'll, you'll taste something that smells bad, and at the same time, um, you will, and, and that's not just bad, that's an, an example of cross-reactivity. You can taste sweet smells a lot. And then you can smell sweet things or smell bad you know, tasting things, right? Uh, one of my favorite things is mint, right? If we say something is minty, we are almost entirely implying flavor information, gustation, right? But I am just going to slap a question mark on that one. If you have access to any mint chewing gum or anything minty at all, I would like you to, well, in a second, pause the video, but allow me to actually say what I want you to pause it for. Uh, I would like you to grab whatever's minty that is, uh, that you can put in your mouth, or is safe to put in your mouth, that's probably an important one, uh, and grab it, holding it in your hand, before you put it anywhere, plug your nose completely. I don't want you to be able to breathe in. Plugging your nose will create a nice pressure gradient in there, and it will also prevent air from easily going from your oral cavity into your nasal cavity. So you plug it like that. I can't even breathe through my nose right now. And then I put something minty in my mouth, and you know what it will taste like? Nothing. There's almost no gustatory information when it comes to mint. Mint is almost entirely an odorant, right? Uh, you are translating it in your brain as flavor, but it is almost entirely an odorant. Once that's in your mouth and you don't taste anything, like chew that gum around, chew it up, get it all over your tongue, you're not gonna taste mint. But while it's on there, before you swallow anything, just do this and you will get a blast of minty flavor. It's really fun. Uh, so, scent odorants can dissolve in saliva and trigger your gustatory chemoreceptors. And compounds that you put in your mouth, uh, the chemicals can you know pass through the air into your nasal cavity and trigger your uh, olfactory chemoreceptors. Very cool. And the interaction between those gives you a complete taste and smell of your food which is kind of cool, right? In fact, uh, your olfactory system, 
will prime your gustatory system. Olfaction prepares you for tasting. Right? So if somebody has put a pie on a windowsill to cool down, right? There's that tasty pie. And there's that mm, tasty smell coming off that pie. And you smell the pie, right? And you start doing that thing as you do. You float through the air. Going after that pie. Oh, floating along uh, on the smell. But something else is happening when you smell something very tasty like that pie or maybe a meaty steak or something. Right? What else happens to your body? What is happening associated with taste? Right? Mm, you start to salivate. Salivation is a reflex that is highly associated with olfaction, which is kind of cool. Ah, uh, next up is vision, but I'm going to stop here for a moment and go to a concert. Um, but I guess the YouTube video won't have a stop here whatsoever, so, uh, whatever. Ha ha, I went to a concert. Okay, we continue where we left off with the human sense of vision. Okay, so obviously humans use their eyes. That's an amazing revelation, I know. So what are the eyes detecting? They are detecting something called visible light. So basically when we talk about visible light, we are talking more broadly about sort of the energy coming from stars and other objects or fabric of the universe. Energy. We call it the electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum is pretty cool. Uh, it's basically just a whole lot of different wavelengths of energy. So when we talk about the different types of energy, we talk about wavelengths. So if you look at a wavelength, energies coming from these sources travels as waves, right? With crests and troughs. And the distance between two crests, crests is the wavelength. Right, so we can measure this in distance, so it's almost always referred to as meters. Um, usually we're measuring, when we talk about visible light at least, we're going to be talking about nanometers. And it goes from on the larger end of wavelength, 700 nanometers, to about 400 nanometers. And if you're in the art world, you might just recognize what is happening here with these different wavelengths. They correspond to the colors we recognize, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, right? So if you've ever been in art, you might have heard the term Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv represents the different colors of visible light. And those colors are entirely dependent on wavelengths. So, uh, I think it's pretty cool that the electromagnetic spectrum doesn't just include light, it includes a lot of things. Here's gamma rays, right? Uh, subject someone to enough of those and they become the Incredible Hulk. Although, Generally, instead of rage powers, you have, like, a body riddled with cancer. But, you know, that's something. X-rays or electromagnetic spectrum, ultraviolet light, 
infrared light, infrared it being heat, microwave radiation right there, and then we transition into radio waves, right? You might have not have thought about that. By the way, cell phones fall firmly in the radio end of the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you're wondering if cell phones are going to cook your brain, the answer is no. No, they're not, because your FM radio doesn't cook your brain. Right? So don't worry about cell phones. Uh, then you have something called long radio waves. So when you see uh, those giant radio telescopes they use to detect things going on in the universe, they're detecting those long radio waves coming from distant stars. Anyway, we're concerned with how the brain detects and interprets images from visible light. And what's the sensory structure that we're going to be looking at? Gee, I don't know. Maybe it's the eyeball. Yes. The human eye is the vis sensory structure that detects visible light. It converts visible light into images, right? It converts light into shapes, right? Contrast, movement. Right, um, you know, lines, right, and all of this translates into the images of what you see. So, we are converting light into images using the eyeball. So, signals from the eye are sent to the brain, and Basically, this is all brain processing. What the eye actually does, right, is you'll have light coming in to the eye. Right, and how much light and where the light gets sensed, right? You'll have like a little section of stuff. And some of those will fire off neuron, uh, neuron impulses and some of those won't. And that's all the eye does. Fires off impulses if light hits a particular cell. If light doesn't hit a particular cell, doesn't fire it. And that is what gives you the electrical, the nervous information. And that actually goes out to the back portion of your brain, the visual cortex. The visual cortex is in the back of the brain, and that is where we're doing all of this, right? Your eye doesn't detect, doesn't create an image. Your eye can't create an image, rather, your eye uh, detects presence or absence of light, right? It has a little sensory area and light present or it isn't. And then the information of where light is and where light isn't is sent to the brain. And the brain does all the work of translating it into what you see. So let's talk about how the eye does this job. All right, so when we talk about the eye, we might want to mention the sclera of the eye. All right, so um, don't shoot until you see this. The sclera is this fibrous tissue called the whites of the eye. The sclera is the whites of the eye. It is thick, fibrous tissue. Uh, so it is quite strong um, and it creates a lot of structural support 
for the eye. It maintains the structure of the eye, the shape. Okay, now at the front of the eye is probably the most important structure for generating proper images, and that is the cornea. The cornea is that rounded, clear structure. So we have this uh, rounded bump and it's clear and the whole point of the cornea is that it can refract light right so what that means is that when light passes through the corneal layer right so here's my corneal layer um, when light comes in depending on where it comes in, it's clear, so it can pass through, but because it has a distinct shape, it bends on its way through. So the cornea bends light. That bending is the refracting of the light. So light bends as it enters the cornea, and it bends towards the back of the eye. Sort of a target structure at the back of the eye. So the cornea is the primary focusing structure. Right? You might think that the lens is what allows you to focus in order to see an image, but it's the cornea that does the work of the focusing. It bends the light towards the sensory information in the eyeball uh, and it focuses light onto that sensory area. So it's the primary focusing structure of the eye. So uh, then when we talk about the eye, it's worth mentioning the ciliary body so the ciliary body is an important structure. Uh, so it's got some muscles. I know it's gonna look an awful lot like I'm just drawing the picture there, but it's very helpful if you also draw. So this structure here is the ciliary body. You know, while I'm at it, I'm going to label that spot that the light get, gets bent towards. Uh, we're going to talk about it shortly, but it is called the fovea. Um, that is basically the most important spot in the eyeball for detecting light information. So the ciliary body is a rather important structure, right? It acts to uh, produce fluids. So it's near the front of the eye. Uh, it connects to the lens. So it's near the front. Uh, connects up to the lens. Uh, connects to muscles. That manipulate the lens. All right, so um, we have these little muscles in the ciliary body. It's near the front, uh, and it's a circular structure. So if you were to look at the eyeball, it would actually, it's not the iris, uh, but it is uh, a circular structure. So it's behind the iris, actually. So um, that's important to note, but I draw this, it, my drawing looks an awful lot like an iris, but it's circular. It's surrounding that entire part of the eye and it kind of divides 
the front of the eye from the back of the eye. And its whole deal is that it's going to make some very important fluids, right? The eye produces fluids called humors. So the humors of the eye are these important fluids. And they serve different functions. We have the aqueous humor, which we'll mention. It's going to serve a circulatory and nutri nutritive uh, purpose. And then the vitreous fluid, which is sort of like stagnant jello. And it's going to uh, sort of team up with your sclera in order to provide that important structure to the eye. So, the iris is in front of the ciliary body. So, we have our eyeball. There's our sclera. All right. Here's our cornea. All right. Then we've got our ciliary body so ciliary body sclera the whites of the eye and then the cornea our primary focusing structure that bends light towards the back of the eye, uh, towards that little focusing structure called the fovea, which we will eventually get to. So, now let's talk about that iris. All right, so, the iris is in front of the ciliary body. It is a pigmented structure that looks real terrible but you know we got what we got this is gonna there we go so it is pigmented with melanin it is obviously circular it's what you want to draw when you draw the front of the eyeball all right you get that going on uh you get that little and there's that circular spot everybody likes to put in there. Make it seem like it's a little shiny. All right, there we go. That's looking nice. So, that is going to be our iris. Uh, so, the whole point of the iris is that it reduces light scattering. Right, so basically, what you have is the iris creates a small opening so that when light passes through, right, it doesn't just pass through uh, in crazy amounts. Like in this previous drawing here, without an iris, when you bend your light into there, right so you've got your light bending in you're going to get large amounts of light passing in and in really bright conditions that can really mess with your ability to see right we'd call that light scattering right uh, so you get light scattered all throughout the back of the eye, that nervous area where the light sensors are, the retina. So you get all this light scattered through there, um, which is bad, okay? Does not help with your vision. So now, um, instead of that, right, a lot of that light gets stopped. And it only allows for 
from very focused light to pass through. So instead of having that massive blast of light going through, we have this focused light. We reduce light scattering. So the melanin is what gives our eyes their color. I have my awesome hazel eyes, which are obviously the best. Actually, uh, eye color seems to have very little in the way of effects for modern human fitness. Um, blue eyes tend to have trouble in bright light. So people with blue eyes tend to be light sensitive. I don't know if the blue doesn't do as good a job allowing light or blocking light so that you get a bit more scattering or what, but that's about all you get when you've got blue eyes and then uh, you have darker eyes which hypothetically might decrease the amount of scattering. So, anyway. Uh, cool. No major, like, the color of your eye doesn't have major effects on you as a human, but the effect of the iris is very cool. Allows that focusing of light down through the center of the iris. Right? So you have blue, brown, and many uh, sort of in between shades, and then the obviously best one, hazel, because it's mine. Okay, so the center of the iris is actually a hollow space. That's pretty dark. I'll shift colors here. But the center of the iris is a hollow space. Uh, so a hollow space, it's called the pupil. Right? So it's not actually a physical structure. It's more the absence of a physical structure. It is the hole through which light travels. And what's cool about this pupil is that it can constrict or dilate. Right? So... When it constricts, the hole uh, gets smaller in diameter. Uh, and when it dilates, it gets larger in diameter, right? So a fully constricted pupil will be like, some people in books like to call it a pinhole. And then here, the dilated one, that's that dinner plate eyes. Right, so um, this is a response to changing light conditions. Uh, so in brighter lights, uh, more light will be able to pass through and potentially overload your sensing cells. So uh, if you constrict in bright conditions, then you can further reduce the scattering effect and the intensity of light reaching those sensory structures. So you constrict in bright lights and then you dilate in low light. So you dilate in low light, constrict in bright light. And you can actually watch that happening. So right here, I have a very cool animated GIF uh, showing someone's pupil adjusting in size, right? Constricting, dilating, constricting, dilating. Right? So, and it's done just by having the doctor wave that little eye, or that little light by. So the iris, and then we have our hole, which is the pupil, the hole at the center of the iris. Changes in diameter to allow more or less light through. 
dilated is its maximum size. You get maximum dilation in lowest light conditions. Constricted, you get maximum constriction in brightest light conditions. So, uh, it controls the amount of light entering the eye. Uh, very useful. Um, your eye can actually be damaged by too much light. So, if you get too much light exposure to the eye, it can become damaged. Uh, so, the pupil is a major defense against that. Okay, continuing on with eye anatomy, let's talk about the lens. So, putting our eyeball back up, right? We have the whites of the eye, the sclera. Right? We have our primary f focusing structure. What's it called now? I'm sure you know. That looks awesome. The cornea. Looks like I'm drawing somebody's face. Anyway, we have this tissue here called the ciliary body. In front of the ciliary body, we have the iris right and the hole in the center of the iris is the pupil pupil right cornea right sclera iris and ciliary body that's making those fluids. All right, so the ciliary body has some little muscles and ligaments and attached to that is the actual lens. So the lens, I'll just go here. Is a clear structure that can adjust focus, do some basically fine focus adjustments. Basically, it allows you to sort of find your, uh, finally tune your focus for near versus far. All right? So, it's inside the iris rally. That, that, that means to say behind the iris. It's behind the iris connected up to the ciliary body involved in fine-tuning the focus. So when we say fine-tuning the focus, the lens can be changed in shape uh, in order to affect the focus. Right? So you can have sort of, uh, let's see, I'll go over here, you can have sort of a shorter, fatter lens and a longer, thinner lens. The lens is a flexible structure, and it is a clear structure, and it affects the bending of the light. So, when you have your short, fat lens, it is good for near focus. And then you can have your long, thin lens that is good for focusing better on far objects. 
So the muscles and the ligaments that connect the ciliary body to the lens will just affect the shape of the lens based on the distance away from you that you're trying to focus on. So little muscles contract, and when those muscles contract, the lens gets thicker and rounder, short and fat, and lets you see near things a little better. Or the muscles relax, and the lens flattens out and becomes long and thin, and it gives you better fine focus on far objects. And that's, that's the lens. That's the function of the lens. So most people think that the lens is the primary focusing structure, but it's the cornea. The lens is just there to help you focus better on near objects or far objects. It's a fine tuner. <coughs> now, age decreases the flexibility of the lens. Uh, basically, when we say this, what we mean is that, uh, where's my, oh, I don't think I have my screen that just blanks things out. Oh, there we go. Screen, blank it. Okay. So, age, it corresponds to decrease flexibility of the lens. Uh, what that means is it doesn't respond well to contracting the muscles and making the lens fatter. Uh, so if it does, it, it reduces the flexibility and it reduces the ability to focus on nearby objects, right? Because you have your long thin when the muscles are relaxed. And then when the muscles are contracted, it goes into that short, fat, round one. Um, and if flexibility decreases, it's just not able to do this as much. Uh, so, unfortunately, it's just a fact of aging. In fact, what you have to do as this progresses is buy some bifocals. All right, bifocals are just a pair of glasses. Some awesome glasses there. Uh, generally in bifocals you have the bottom of a bifocal being a magnifying lens not like special not prescription it just magnifies things so here the top of a bifocal generally has no effect on the images you're looking at. It's not magnifying images. It's not making images smaller. It's just sort of like a clear lens that doesn't alter the bending of light. But the bottom of a bifocal lens has a magnifying effect so that when you need to see something near, you just look through the bottom of your lens. And that's why when you have old people, they adjust their glasses forward a little so that it's easier to see through the bottom and then they look through the bottom of their lenses. And that's because they can't get that short, fat lens as well anymore. So, sucks, but that's how the eye do. Eh, let's lighten things up with some humor, huh? <laughs> Biology pun. Yeah. Okay, so there are two types of humors. Now remember, uh, when we say humor, what we're referring to is fluids produced by the ciliary body. Because remember, that ciliary body sort of divides the eye front to back.
is my drawings are getting progressively worse as time continues, apparently. Wow, this is just... I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna erase this. I'm not feeling good about this at all. Go away. And then we're just gonna... A little eye in miniature. Cornea, right? Put in our iris. Right, and then we have our lens. So with all of these things put in there, we can see that basically we have a distinct front and back, right? So here versus here. This is the front of the eye and this is the back of the eye. The ciliary body and the lens create a physical division between the front and the back of the eye. You don't have fluids crossing back and forth. You have a distinct physical barrier between the front and the back. So in the front, the ciliary body produces something called the aqueous humor. Aqueous humor implies that it's got an awful lot of aqua in it, right? So this is a very watery fluid. Right? So the ciliary body is producing a very watery fluid. Um, it's an awful lot like blood plasma when you analyze the fluid in there. So it's got a lot of the same uh, dissolved proteins in it. Um, obviously it's not carrying red blood cells but it is producing some dissolved fluids. Uh, so um, the whole point of the ciliary body uh, is that it uh, produces... Ugh, the whole point of the aqueous humor is to provide nutrients to the structures in the front of the eye. Right? So you're providing nutrients to the lens. Right? You feed the lens and it's kind of a terrible thing without getting like deep into it let's just say we feed the active structures in the front of the eye right so you've got the muscles associated with the ciliary body they need food right you, they also produce waste, right? You've got live cells associated with the iris, live cells associated with the, uh, the, the eye. So there's some live cells in there. So it feeds active structures, basically any live cells in the front of the eye. Now the cool thing about the aqueous humor is that it cycles. In other words, it's produced and it exits the eye. Produced and exits the eye. So you have a continuous cycle. It's replenished when it exits. So, um, very important. Living cells generate waste. You've got to get rid of the waste. So, not only are you providing them nutrients, you are also collecting waste and getting rid of it when it exits the front of the eye. Uh, this is very different from the vitreous humor. The vitreous humor is this jelly-like fluid. Alright, so it's this gel. It's thick. Uh, it is behind the ciliary body. And it is not actively produced. So it's produced during embryonic of development. 
And once embryonic development is complete, that's it. You don't produce any more vitreous humor. And there's no cycling of vitreous humor, right? Does it cycle? No. No, it does not. It's basically stagnant. It's this gel-like fluid, this gelatinous fluid, that's produced during embryonic development and is stagnant in the back of the eye. Uh, it acts with the sclera to provide structural support to the eye, helps maintain the shape of the eye. Um, it does not really have any other function. Uh, now, over time, particles can get from the eye into the vitreous humor. So you might shed some particles from the cell linings uh, in the eyeball. So there's a lining of cells like this. And some of them may get shed into the vitreous humor. And basically they just float around. And those are literally the floaters. So when you're looking, especially when you're like looking through a microscope or a camera viewfinder or something, occasionally you see something, some kind of movement in your eye. Sometimes they're easy to see when you close your eyes. Uh, but whenever you see something just sort of drift across your field of vision, that's a floater. And it's literally just particles uh, floating around in your vitreous humor. Because the vitreous humor is stagnant, those particles aren't like cycled out or broken down. They just float. They are harmless. So worry not about your floaters. Okay, so now let's talk about the nervous layer of the eye. The layer responsible for generating nervous impulses. So we have our sclera, the whites of the eye, that strong fibrous connective tissue. We have the primary focusing structure, the cornea. We have our ciliary body producing our aqueous and vitreous humors. Ciliary body. In front of the ciliary body, we have the iris. The hole in the iris is the pupil, right? Then we have our clear, little, long and thin or short and fat lens. And the whole idea is to get light from the outside environment, bending through the cornea, bending a little bit at the lens to the back of the eye, where we have an important layer of tissue that's going to be all about sensing the light. Right? This is the layer of tissue that is involved with light, yes or no, the retina. Right, so it's inside the eye, in the back of the eye, lining the back of the eye. Um, it has, uh, it, it's the nervous layers. Uh, it has a couple of layers. Um, you have the actual cells uh, that generate a nerve impulse, right? So here's your little nerve cell. And it's ready to generate an impulse. And then you also have the connected to it 
the part that actually senses light. And what's interesting about this is that those light sensors are actually underneath the nerve generating layers. Uh, fascinating, because light has to pass by the nervous layer. It has to pass over these nerves in order to actually get back here and be sensed. Um, and that has a consequence we'll talk about, which is pretty cool and specific only to the eyes of organisms that have bones, the vertebrates. Uh, it's, and, I, and I'll mention what's especially cool about that. So anyway, we have the retina. These are the nervous layers where we have our light sensing structures, the cells that detect light and fire off a nervous impulse to be translated by the brain. So they detect light and they convert light into nerve impulses. Detect light and convert into nervous impulses. Convert it into action potentials. The then this information is collected together and sent to the brain. All right, so there are two fundamentally different types of sensing structures associated with the nervous layer. We have the rods and we have the cones. So when we talk about detecting light, we'll often talk about rod cells and cone cells. All right. Rods are great at detecting light. Cones are good at detecting colors. So rods just detect light. I like to call it sort of a yes, no. Whereas cones do a much better job at resolving contrast, like the differences between things. If I put two pieces of paper on top of each other, the ability to, whoa, what just happened? Okay. The ability to see where one piece of paper stops and the other begins uh, is heavily affected by your cones. Right, so, if I have these two sheets of paper here, right, they're kind of, kind of, ratchety pieces of paper. But this little area here, where we have some very fine details, right? If I hold that close, most human eyes can pretty easily detect where those two pieces of paper are in relation to each other. It's pretty easy to see that line. That's not primarily coming from your rods. That's uh, your cones that are resolving that contrast. They're giving you details. And most importantly, they're delivering you color information. So rods detect light, yes, no, whereas cones do great contrast details in color. So why even have rods? Uh, rods are champions at low light detection. Right? You might notice when it gets real dark out and uh, your eyes adjust to it, you're not seeing all the colors anymore. That's because your low, light your low light vision as a human is almost entirely dependent on your rod cells. So, lights versus colors. Now, in the back of that eye, 
we have a little special spot, uh, a pit. So let's choose a color here, right? So we have a pit of cells, right? So you have this little pit in that nervous layer. And that little pit is called the fovea, right? Um, sometimes people, uh, so, so it's this little circular area and it is an extremely high concentration of cones, right? So nearly, in a human being, nearly all the cones are concentrated in the fovea. This is because, as I mentioned earlier, cones aren't that great at giving you low light vision. Uh, they're great at resolving a lot of fine details and contrast, seeing the edges of things, um, uh, but they're not real great. They need a lot of light to do so. So when we talk about that cornea focusing, I mentioned that fovea because the whole point of that cornea is to focus light onto the fovea, right? So the light is focused from the cornea uh, affected slightly by the lens directly to the fovea, getting as much light bathed onto that fovea as possible so that we can get those cones activated. Okay, so um, now another cool thing I wanted to talk about uh, with the nervous layer is right what's going on with the fact that light is detected behind the cells that act like behind the parts of the cell that actually fire nerve impulses right so light is being detected my wonderful rods and cones, right? So um, this right here, when the light comes in, right, focused onto that fovea here is where the light is being detected. But here, this layer on top, that is what has to send the nerve impulses. Let's go green since I already used red for the rod cells. So, the green layer of the retina is the parts of the cells that send nerve impulses, and then I have my little rods and cones. So, once these fire off, they shoot their ne nerve impulse along here, right? You've got nerve impulses coming from along here, and we need to get to the brain. So one of the more fascinating things about the vertebrate eye, the eye of animals that have bones, is that in order to actually go past the eye and to the brain, we can't have light sensing cells, right? So, what we create is this area on the eye where no information is generated. 
right, we get no info here. We cannot detect light because we have to collect that stuff together in order to get information along the optic nerve to the brain. This here is the vertebrate eye blind spot. Every vertebrate, every animal with bones has a blind spot in their eye where the, the actual layer where the nerve impulses are sent has to penetrate past the detecting layer in order to actually create an optic nerve. So you get this blind spot. It's at the back of the eye and there is a blind spot because nerves are on top of detecting cells so when you need to go past the eye you can't have detecting cells there kind of cool so this goes to the back of the brain at the visual cortex where we do all that processing of whether or not a like because the information here at these cells is light yes no so if the cone detects light fires an impulse right i overlooked it i think uh you have three different types of cone cells by the way you have just one type of rod let's see but uh let me blank the screen a little bit here screen okay so This is your rod cell. However, your human has three types of cone cells. green, red, and blue. So these three cone cells are how we generate all our color information. Red, green, blue. And we say red cone cells, green cone cells, blue cone cells because of the wavelengths of visible light they're reacting to, right? The blue is going to be somewhere like 500, I'm just estimating, anyway. But they react to different wavelengths of visible light. That's like 600 to 700. For the life of me, I can't remember green. Uh, but yeah, you have three different cone cells reacting to different wavelengths of visible light. And then just one rod cell that basically if it's in the range of visible light, the rod cell goes off when it gets hit. It cannot collect color information. Um, it's kind of like those thermal nociceptors that can't detect whether or not the damage is from hot or cold, right? A rod cell goes off in light and cannot give you any more information than yes, light. Whereas your cone cells go off, uh, the red cells going off in red, green and green wavelengths, blue and blue wavelengths. So that's part of the reason that the, you're getting so much more detail is because you have the ability to resolve different colors. So, got that blind spot there, goes to the visual cortex, rods and cones, well, got ahead of myself apparently. All right, so rods just detect light. Uh, so this gives you black and white vision, grayscale, I guess, uh, and is primarily responsible for your low light or night vision. Um, gives you a little bit of contrast, uh, gives you some contrast information, you know, shadows moving. Uh, you have around 125 million rods in the eye. So they are much more distributed throughout the retina than the cones. Most of the rods are near the fovea, but they can be distributed. The cones, there are three types, red, green, and blue. 
uh, and they are almost entirely concentrated in the fovea. You have about 7 million per eye. One of the reasons why you kind of need as much light as possible focusing onto the fovea. Uh, we're almost done with eyes, so let's continue to what goes wrong with eyes. Glaucoma. So, glaucoma is one of the eye pathologies that we will mention. Um, glaucoma is basically where we have a, uh, it's a pathology of the humors. And what I mean by that is that uh, block, glaucoma blocks, when you have glaucoma, uh, the aqueous humors, the aqueous humor can no longer exit the eye. Something blocks the exit of the aqueous humor. Uh, so, that is the cause of glaucoma. Blockage of the exit of aqueous humor. Now, this is a problem because you build up the aqueous humor in the eye. Aqueous humor builds up. And as you increase that buildup of aqueous humor, you increase pressure in the front. And there's only so much the front of that eye can bulge out. Uh, and then you'll start to see an increase of pressure in the back and this can be very dangerous because the retina can be easily damaged by pressure so when you have that pressure on the retina of the eye when you have this buildup of pressure up against the retina, you can actually start to kill cells in the retina. Um, and you can also cause some dangerous pathologies, like if the retinal layer uh, detaches a little, right? So if you've got your sclera here, um, I didn't talk about like the other layers, but you might have the retina become detached. And this is bad, okay? So, uh, pressure builds up in the back of the eye and damages the retinal layer, um, right? So if you get enough damage, blindness. So uh, let's go through, run it by the numbers, right? So our signs of glaucoma are <coughs> eye pressure. That's our big one. Eye pressure. If you go to the eye doctor, they put you in front of that thing that blows air on your eyeballs. And part of that, uh, and, and that machine is actually measuring pressure. So, an increase in eye pressure in the eyes, right? Uh, symptoms would be pain. It's very painful to experience this swelling and pressure in the eye. So, the eye has a, you know, fixed size. So if you get a buildup of pressure in the eye, even a minor buildup of pressure against the actual orbit in your skull, the tissue of your skull's orbit will cause significant pain. Uh, you can also have decreased vision for whatever that means. So that could mean blurry vision that could go all the way to blindness. 
So, there's sort of a spectrum of your decreased vision from blurry to blind. But pain is a major f uh, thing in glaucoma. So, signs, uh, buildup of eye pressure due to the aqueous humor not being able to exit. So, the cause glaucoma is something blocking the exit of the aqueous humor. Signs would be a buildup of eye pressure. Symptoms would be pain and decreased vision, right? Uh, cure is non-existent. Treatments, right? Generally, there's not a lot of good treatments for glaucoma. Uh, one of the basic things is pain management, right? So the main thing you do when you have glaucoma is try to manage the pain. Um, not a lot you can do. If there's some kind of physical object in there, you could potentially have surgery. But that is uncommon. I, well, you know what? I'm stating that, but from what I'm aware of, glaucoma doesn't tend to have an obvious blockage that can be surgically removed. Let me restate it that way so that I'm not just throwing out something as a fact uh, when I don't have the info to back that up. So, uh, yeah. Cataracts is another eye pathology. So, signs of cataracts. All right, well, this is our image of cataracts. Let's switch colors. That'll be nice. So, signs. Right? Well, um, you have a, uh, how do I want to put that? Opaque. Um, uh, I don't know, my words are abandoning me at the moment. But you have sort of an opaque uh, lens. There's probably a, a good adjective in there. But hey, here's the eye that's got cataracts. So if you can think of another good adjective for what's happening here. But the visible sign is an opaqueness in the lens, right? Uh, so, symptoms are decreased visual acuity. You have decreased visual ability. And again, this is on a spectrum from blurry to blind. All right. So, the ultimate consequence, if it's untreated... you go blind. However, it is treatable. Hooray! Um, so, the treatment is actually a surgical implant. What that is, is that they remove the old lens and replace it with a clear synthetic lens. It's not going to do the job of your lens as well. Oh, cloudy. That's the word I wanted. Oh, well, it's not going to do the job of your original lens as well, like the whole get short and fat and get long and thin to adjust fine vision you'll probably end up needing bifocals. But generally, I would consider that better than blind. Okay, so the cause of cataracts is ultraviolet damage, right? So cataracts is a cumulative lifetime exposure deal. 
the more ultraviolet radiation you get from being outside, the more damage you do to your lens. That's why eye doctors uh, talk about you wearing sunglasses all the time. They're like, oh, you should wear your sunglasses. Are you wearing sunglasses? Wear your sunglasses. That's because the more you wear sunglasses outside, the more you reduce your cumulative lifetime exposure to ultraviolet radiation. Pretty much everybody ends up with cataracts if you live long enough. So, opaque cloudy lens. Treatment is to remove the lens and replace it with a surgical implant. All right, last pathology to mention is color blindness. So when we talk about color blindness, we're prime. Whoa, hey, come on back. When we talk about color blindness, we're primarily going to be talking about red-green color blindness. So let's talk about the uh, spectrum of visible light. Actually, might be worth it to uh, yeah, to go back to that slide that had. Our spectrum okay so we know that there are three basic lenses right you have our lenses there are three basic co uh, cone cells you have the red cone cells the green cone cells and the blue cone cells so now Let's talk about red-green color blindness. All right, red-green color blindness. In red green green color blindness, you have your red cone and you have your green cone. Right? And they are supposed to detect the red wavelengths and the green wavelengths separately. So there's your range of wavelengths that are green. Uh, and then you have your range of wavelengths that are red, right, with that orange and yellow between them. So, orange, yellow, right. Uh, and your brain just uses the amount of light detected along this spectrum here to give you those colors. Orange and yellow uh, are resolved by how much red and how much green you're getting. Because you can sort of mix them a little bit. Anyway, what is red-green color blindness? Kind of works like this. Uh, here's your green cone and here's your red cone and I'm gonna draw up the wavelengths that they are supposed to detect so the green cone in red green color blindness fires off to both red and green wavelengths. And same here. The red cone fires off to both red and green wavelengths, right? So the red and the green cones uh, sort of uh, respond to overlapping wavelengths.
What this means is that your red cone responds to anything along in here. And your green cone responds to anything along in here. And so ultimately, you can't resolve the difference between red and green. It looks the same to you. All right? So if someone has a bunch of dots with red and green intermixed in there, it will be nearly impossible for them to tell you which dots are red and which dots are green. And you can even put some orange and yellow in there. And that will be very difficult to resolve because they're in that between red and green area. So, because they have wavelength, uh, because their cone cells are sort of uh, responding to overlapping wavelengths, they're unable to resolve the differences between a number of different colors. Right? So, um, the treatment for this uh, is interesting. Uh, there's not a lot you can do with red green color blindness and this is the reason is that red green color blindness is Genetic Right you'd have to remember way back in time that it is an X-linked Genetic disorder it's carried on the X chromosome so if you're male and you have red-green color blindness, like my buddy, uh, he can blame his mom entirely. Anyway, people talk about those glasses that you can put on in order to resolve the differences. Uh, basically, those glasses are highly polarized, and they basically, um, what they do is they just wipe out a fair amount of the wavelengths that come through the glasses lens such that you now get a completely separate uh, wavelengths there and you can once again respond to the separate wavelengths so it wipes out the overlap Right, those special glasses eliminate the overlapping wavelengths um, they're polarized they only allow certain wavelengths of light through uh, so that's kind of interesting um, they're specifically made to each specific person, uh, which means they are, uh, the clinical term is crazy expensive. My buddy, um, just lives with his color blindness because you know what? Why pay a thousand dollars to see vague differences? So. You have some not, your, your cones have abnormal function. I wouldn't say non-functional. I'd say abnormal. Abnormally functioning. Cones. So, cause of color blindness is genetic. Signs of color blindness are cones that have overlapping wavelengths. Uh, symptoms are unable to resolve the difference between colors. Um, treatment is crazy expensive glasses that are polarized to eliminate the overlaps that you detect. Um, 
By the way, what someone sees when they are red-green colorblind is basically impossible to know, which is kind of a fascinating philosophical thing right there. They're the ones who could tell you what they see, but they don't see red or green the way you do. So how do you know what they see? Hmm. Hmm. Perhaps you should have a glass of wine and smoke a cigarette with your friends in Paris and discuss it. Okay. Almost done with eye stuff. Eye pathologies. Good old near and far sightedness, right? I have glasses because I am insanely nearsighted. I just took these off and I literally can't see anything on my laptop screen. So, uh, what this comes out to is a abnormal length of the eye. of the whole eye itself, right? So you can have a short fat eye. So um, if you have like right, your normal eye, right? Someone might have an eye that is shorter. All right, uh, so in that case, that's where the normal eye length would be. And someone might have an eye that is longer. And so, that might be where the normal eye length is. And this is important because here's your fovea and your fovea would be in a different spot on there. And the light getting bent into the eye right, uh, is bent towards the fovea. Now, in regular nearsighted and farsightedness, you don't have a disorder of the cornea. The cornea bends the light exactly as it should. But that means that right here, where the light all comes to a point, at the fovea here, the light is not coming to a point at the fovea, right? The light is coming to a point back where the fovea would be. So this is your actual fovea this is the hypo the fovea that would have been so you're not getting light focused properly on the fovea and a similar thing happens in farsightedness uh, it's bent towards the fovea uh, and so what ends up happening uh, is that um, it comes to a point right there's our point at our hypothetical fovea But now wait, I, I was uh, anyway. I'm explaining it. Okay, and then here's our actual position, our actual fovea. 
and the light continues past the point and you lose that focus. So again, light is not properly focused on the fovea. So light doesn't focus on the fovea. Okay, so I always mess up whether nearsightedness is the short eyeball or the long eyeball. Nearsightedness is the long eyeball. Farsightedness is the short eyeball. So let's just write that in there regardless of what I might have been saying here. So this is farsighted. And then the long eyeball is nearsighted. All right, now we got to have our fancy science words for these. Uh, so when your eyeball is too long and you are nearsighted, this is myopia. All right? Myopia. Now, if you've ever heard someone be like, oh, well, that's very myopic. They're, they're using the term for nearsightedness uh, in, in order to imply that you're not looking far enough ahead in time. Anyway, um, the short one is hyper my, uh, hypermetropia, which I should write out considering I covered it up. So, hyper... <sighs> now, astigmatism is a little different, right? So astigmatism often comes with myopia or hypermetropia, uh, but astigmatism isn't caused by... The length of the eye. Astigmatism is a defect of the cornea. So here's your normal cornea with its normal bump. So astigmatism is an abnormal cornea. Generally Thinning. Well, that turned out really well. Anyway, thinning in certain parts of the cornea, right? And that changes the shape of the cornea. So here's my normal cornea shape with my bump, right? And astigmatism might look something a little bit like this. So there's my bump. But then I have a thin part. No, I'm making that too thick. Okay. There's it. So, here's my astigmatism. I want to go into my bump. But suddenly I have this thin layer here. and it alters the bump. Right? So, that thin layer there means that light in that area doesn't bend correctly. Right? So, oh, that's a bad color for a blank screen. There's my light bending through, all going for the point at the fovea. So with my astigmatism, there's my light 
bending through, all going towards my point, and then, right? So uh, it alters how light passes through the cornea. Basically, uh, light doesn't reach the fovea as well. How do I want to write that? Can't focus certain areas. Right. Let's get dumb. Thin parts don't bend light to phobia. Uh, phobia. Okay, so, um, yeah, so here's our sign. The symptom is simply blurry vision. That's the symptom of uh, myopia and hypermetropia, blurry vision, right? So the sign is thinning of a part of the cornea. The symptom is blurry vision. The treatment is glasses or contacts. All right, so basically, they uh, map where the thinning is, and then they give you some eyeglasses, and the eyeglasses bend light in preparation so that the thinning does, like, so if you have your eyeglasses, then the light comes in, it's going to bend the light. The light that hits that astigmatism area is going to be pre-bent towards the fovea. So eyeglasses are actually pretty cool, especially when it comes to treating astigmatism. Uh, being able to properly treat astigmatism is sort of like a relatively modern thing to the last, like, three decades. Uh, astigmatism in the past has been very difficult to treat because you've got to grind the glass lens very gently. Once upon a time, that was not something that you could do in mass production. So, anyway... Stigmatism, abnormally thin, um, abnormal thinning of the cornea. Uh, treatments in all of these is corrective lenses. Um, and then you can also have LASIK. So that's reshaping of the cornea. Uh, while it sounds like it's laser surgery, it uses a very fine blade. And it shaves the cornea to the right shape, to a corrective shape. Uh, right. Uh, so most people with myopia and or hypermetropia, right? Most people can get LASIK. Uh, astigmatism depends entirely on how thin that thin part is. Because if the cornea is already too thin, shaving is impossible. You don't wanna like structurally destabilize that and then have somebody leaking aqueous humor out of a hole you put in their eyeball. So. Uh, an astigmatism can be bad enough that there's no LASIK and you're just stuck with your corrective lenses. But, I mean, that's not the worst thing in the world. Okay, now we move on to hearing. Okay. Last thing. This is taking a while. I'm going to take a second and drink some water while people pause this video.
Okay. Hearing. Your sense of hearing is detecting sound. Sound travels as waves. And it travels as waves in a medium. So when they say, you know, in space, no one can hear you scream, that's because there's a vacuum in space. There's no matter for sound to travel through. So sound can travel through uh, water pretty well. And of course, it can travel through air. But it has to be traveling in a medium. So your hearing is designed to detect sound traveling in the medium and convert it into impulses that your brain can interpret. So those waves vibrate the medium. Hearing is taking those vibrations and turning them into impulses. And so when we talk about those vibrations and hearing, it's worth noting that when we talk about hearing, we talk about the human range of sounds we can detect from 20 hertz to 16 kilohertz. So if we have a wave, we talked about wavelengths briefly, you might have a short wavelength or a long wavelength, right? And then in order to fully understand hertz, you just slap a person in front of that or some kind of detector and you wait a second and the amount of waves that pass by right the wavelengths that go by in one second wavelengths per second is hertz All right so uh, a very long wavelength right has very few of those passing by so 20 Hertz is low tones that have long wavelengths 16 kilohertz is high tones with very short wavelengths. So there you go. Number of waves that pass by per second. And let's get right into how your ear is going to take waves per second and convert it into information that your brain can interpret. Though so the sensory structures involved in hearing are the outer ear the outer ear includes the pinna. The pinna is what you immediately think of when I say ear, right? That is the ear, the ear proper, right? Uh, and then you got the fun little shapes and a little shapes there and some fun little stuff there and then you have the ear hole. So this is the pinna, the external structure of the ear, right? Its whole job is to collect and funnel sound into the ear canal, the auditory canal, which takes it to the interior of your head. So it collects and funnels sound into the auditory canal. Temporal differences gives you location information, right? So uh, you have an ear here and an ear here on a person. There we go. And if I have sound coming from this source, right, those sound waves are going to reach this ear first and this ear second. 
and the amount of time it took for the sound to get to this ear versus this ear is going to allow your brain to interpret the information and know that it came from the left, well, came from this side, right? And then some of these structures in here, right, all these little bins and folds and whatnot, uh, these are associated with detecting above and below, right? So you have your speaker above or your speaker below, and these little things uh, will allow sound to reflect around and get there. So if it's coming from above, there's a slight difference between how long it reflects off of these structures and into your auditory canal versus how long it reflects off of the structures at the bottom of the ear and into the auditory canal. And so the time it takes to reflect off stuff into the auditory canal is going to give you information. In fact, if you take something like a little bit of Play-Doh and just smooth it gently into your ear like this, leaving your auditory canal perfectly intact. Right? Do this to both ears and then someone playing songs uh, or playing sounds um, can get it above your head and below your head and you will have an extremely difficult time actually determining where the sound is in relation because it's all those fun little bumps in the pinna that give you above or below information. Okay, so we're funneling sound into the auditory canal and that sound goes through the auditory canal and ends at the middle ear. The barrier between the middle ear and the outer ear is the tympanic membrane. And if you've ever seen a timpani at a concert, that's a big old drum, the ear drum. Right? So the tympanic membrane is the end of the outer ear. And this leads us to the middle ear. So the middle ear has one job. Amplify waves. It needs to take the waves coming from the outside Re and striking the tympanic membrane and amplify them enough to produce information uh, in the middle ear or in the inner ear, right? So this is sort of basically just a way station. The middle ear is air filled, right? Uh, and it also has ossicles, which are the smallest bones in the human body. There are three ossicles, right? We have the incus, uh, the, well, let's just go through them. Yeah, okay, so got ahead of myself there. We'll talk about ossicles in a moment. One of the most important structures in the middle ear is the eustachian tube. Right, so if you actually look at someone and their outer ear and their ear canal, and then you have the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, and then you have your middle ear middle ear connects up into the pharynx the back of the nasal cavity
This tube connecting the middle ear to the nasal cavity is called the eustachian tube. And it has one job. Equalize pressure. Right? Because the pressure in the middle ear should be equal to the pressure in the outer ear. Unequal pressure uh, stresses the eardrum, the tympanic membrane. In other words, uh, if you have a buildup of pressure in the inner ear, right? You have a big buildup of pressure in the inner ear, or in the middle ear, uh, and the pressure here is higher than the outer ear, then it's going to start pushing the tympanic membrane out. That's going to be very painful. You want to be able to equalize the pressure. And same deal if you reverse that. If the pressure in the outer ear gets much higher than the pressure in the middle ear, that tympanic membrane is going to be distorted inward. And that's going to be very painful. So, you need to be able to keep the pressure in the middle ear and the outer ear equal in order to keep all the structures in there nice and healthy. That's why you often do that equalizing your ears thing where you feel them pop right if you go into the water like swimming to the bottom of that nine foot part of the pool uh, you'll often feel a bunch of pressure and then if you do that a little bit under the water if you pop the your ears a bit you'll get the pressure equalized and that pressure will go away right and if you're driving into the mountains your ears pop because the pressure out here, like altitude, decreases air pressure, so you get less pressure out here. And so your ears pop when you equalize the pressure. I'm pointing at this thing, but you can't see that. So, um, yeah. It, as you go higher in altitude, then you get less pressure out here, and so you have to pop your ears and decrease the pressure in your middle ear same deal with swimming in the water so equalizing the pressure that's the whole point of the eustachian tube okay now let's talk about those actual ossicles their job is to amplify the waves and get them to the inner ear the inner ear is where we actually generate the nerve impulses so first off, we have the malleus called the hammer. Malleus, hammer. Malleus is the more important term. The malleus is attached to the eardrum. Uh, so when the eardrum vibrates, right, when sound collected from the pinna traveling through the auditory canal hits the eardrum, uh, and then the tympanic membrane starts to vibrate. The malleus connected to it also starts to vibrate. And as it vibrates, it bumps into another bone, the incus. Right? The incus is the next bone in the three ossicle pathway, also called the anvil, because a hammer. hammers on an anvil. Clang, clang, clang. Anyway, so the malleus 
hammers on the incus. And so vibrations transmit from the tympanic membrane to the malleus, from the malleus to the incus, and from the incus to the stapes, also called the stirrups, because of how they're shaped. So the stapes are a funky looking little bone that kind of look like the stirrups that you put your feet into when you're riding a horse. Right? So, got sort of a funky little shape. That's why they're called the stirrups. So, sound passes into the auditory canal, vibrates the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane vibrates the malleus. The malleus vibrates the incus. The incus vibrates the stapes. The stapes vibrates against a membrane called the oval window. The oval window is a membrane that it connects uh, the, the that separates the uh, middle ear from the inner ear. So vibration against the oval window is what's then going to send the sound waves to the inner ear. Station tubes equalize pressure, empty into the pharynx behind the nasal cavity, what they call the nasopharynx. Uh, unequal pressure puts stress on the tympanic membrane, causes bulging of the membrane, either inward or outward, can be intensely painful. Uh, children tend to get ear infections more often than adults because they have short eustachian tubes that are thin in diameter. Adult eustachian tubes are much larger in diameter, so while inflammation is painful, it's less likely to actually inflame enough to shut off the middle ear from the nasopharynx. In children, a small amount of inflammation can just seal that eustachian tube and then whatever pressure is in there is higher than the outside and it bulges and it sucks and it hurts. So let that go long, too long and it, it will cause the tympanic membrane to rupture. The good news is that the tympanic membrane regenerates. So uh, that was the traditional treatment for people with ear infections, like chronic ear infections if it had gone on a while and a kid was in obvious pain, a doctor would actually take a very thin needle and poke a hole in the tympanic membrane, rupture it for the kid. Because once the tympanic membrane ruptures, then the pressure automatically equalizes and you feel much better. I know I've had a tympanic membrane rupture as an adult because I don't like going to doctors because I'm an idiot. Okay. So, we have now the inner ear. The inner ear is a fascinating structure. It is not just for hearing. It actually has multiple roles. There are three different parts of the inner ear. The cochlea, the cochlea is the part for hearing. And we'll go through that first. Then we have the vestibule, and that detects the position of your body uh, with regards to your head versus gravity. And then we have the semicircular canals, which detect rotation of the body in space. So let's start with the cochlea. So we had the pinna. And we have the auditory canal, and we have the tympanic membrane. The drawing is questionable at best. Okay, so you have the tympanic membrane, and it connects to the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and the stapes connects to the oval window. This little membrane here. So, oval 
window. So basically sound being collected in the pinna through the auditory canal, amplified with the ossicles and transmitted to the oval window, is sending the, in, the sound waves into the inner ear, the cochlea. The cochlea is filled with a fluid, right? I am going to do a conceptual drawing of the cochlea. So here's our inner membrane, our inner membrane. That's our oval window. Right. This is conceptual because I don't really want to try and attempt to draw a proper spiraling structure. So, it is a spiraling structure. And we're going to completely ignore that. Right? Sound is going to travel through the fluid inside. Now, also inside is a membrane. This is called the tectorial membrane. Connected to the tectorial membrane, well, not connected to the tectorial membrane, but associated with the tectorial membrane are little cells that have what we often refer to as hairs. So these are our hair cells. And again, this drawing is conceptual, not anatomically correct. Okay, so there's some hair cells. We have the tectorial membrane, we have some hair cells, and what is going on? Well, here's my hair cell with its little hairs. Right? And when those little hairs, this hair cell, is connected up to uh, nerve fibers, and so the hair cell can generate a nerve impulse. So what actually causes this thing to generate its nerve impulse, you ask? Well, that's pretty easy. If a hair cell has its hairs getting bent. These are called stereocilia. The hairs on the hair cells. These are not hairs as you know them. These are not hairs on your head. If you lose stereocilia, you can't like shoot some Rogaine into your inner ear and regrow them. These are little cellular projections that under the microscope look a little like hairs. So, anyway, when you bend the hairs, you get a nerve impulse. All right, now we know everything we need to know in order to understand how hearing works. The oval window vibrates and the fluid vibrates, right? And when the fluid vibrates, this little membrane also vibrates. And what's neat about this membrane is that different wavelengths of sound vibrate it in different spots. Right? 
so Right, so I, I tried to do some like shorter wavelengths, medium wavelengths, and here's my best attempt at a long wavelength. Right, short, mid, long. Just to illustrate that a long wavelength of sound will vibrate the tectorial membrane in a different location from a short wavelength. Right, so when the tectorial membrane vibrates and you get a wave, right, the little stereo cilia next to that wave, ah, that drawing is awful. Those little stereo cilia next to the wave get bent. Oh, there's my cell. And there's my stereo cilia getting bent. Whereas over here, I like that. So, boop. So, a wave. Right? Fluid vibrates and that causes the tectorial membrane to vibrate and when the tectorial bends hairs we get a nerve impulse so now that we know that different wavelengths bend the dic uh, tectorial membrane at different locations we can uh, see how humans are able to resolve different sounds, right? So there's one location. And then, like, someone played two tones, a high and a low. And so the cells, the hair cells here, are bending in different spots, right? And here's some hair cells that are not bending at all. And then over here, they get bent. And over here, they get bent. And so the location, uh, basically which hair cells are getting bent, tells you which tone is getting produced, right? Your brain determines tone by which hair cells are firing. It's pretty darn cool. That just automatically switched, so your brain determines tone by which hair cells are firing. Oval window vibration leads to fluid vibration. Fluid vibration vibrates the tectorial membrane. Tectorial membrane is vibrated in different locations, different parts, based on the hertz, the waves of the sound. Right? And when that tectorial membrane vibrates, it bends the hairs of the hair cells. When the hair cells get bent, that sends nerve impulses, 
right? Stereo cilia hair like projections. When they bend, you get an impulse. So different cells bending means different hertz, different tones. Yay! Okay, on to the vestibule. So that's hearing. Hearing is done. Hooray! Okay. So, um, let's talk about the vestibule and the utricle and the saccule. So, here's Jimmy. All right? And Jimmy, in his inner ear, has structures specifically uh, to help with detecting head tilt. And that will give him information on where he is in relation to gravity. Right? So, how this works is inside the vestibule of the inner ear, we have a utricle and a saccule that have hair cells in them. So here's my utricle, um, and here's my saccule. And inside the utricle and saccule are hair cells. So, bop, 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 bop. Too lazy. Those are the hairs. And even lazier now. There's my hair cells. Right? So we know that in order to send an impulse, hair cells have to get bent. Well, we also know that these are going to detect the position of the head with regards to gravity. So inside these little uh, structures housed in the vestibule of the ear is a gel-like fluid and these calcified structures. Right? So it's filled with a gel. And then we have those hair cells. And then we have something called an otolith. The rocks in your brain. These are little calcified structures. A little bit like rocks. Um, and enough that they're called otoliths. And lith is stone. So, ear stones. So basically, they just sit in there and wait for gravity to do something. Right? So, if Jimmy turns his head to the left, right, tilts his head, then those utricles and saccules tilt. And when the utricles and saccules tilt, the rocks shift. Right? Not rocket surgery yet. So my rocks are shifting. And that bends certain hairs. So, for instance, now we have a bunch of hairs here that are not bent. And it's these hairs that are getting bent. And we have some hairs that are not bent. And then some hairs that are getting bent. Right? So, shifting your head in position changes how those stones roll around in the gel 
and changes which hair cells are getting bent. So now as we've shifted like this, instead of these hairs being evenly distributed, right? Here we've got those hairs nice and evenly distributed. When I shift over to the left, the hairs start to fall to the left. And I get these hair cells here not firing impulses and these ones firing. And same dip, same thing. When I shift to the left, these hair these rocks start to even out a little bit. Right now, like this entire area is not firing. Whereas here, they even out a little bit and you get fewer cells. Anyway, you get the idea. Shifting your position in regards to gravity shifts those stones around. So the utricle is on the horizontal plane. And the saccule is on the vertical plane. So on the horizontal plane, those stereocilia, those hair cells, are pointing up. And on the saccule, those hair cells are pointing to the sides. So you got up and to the sides. So turn, turn, or turn, turn. Get it? Nice. So saccule is on the vertical plane. Utricles on the horizontal plane. And that's the vestibule. It determines head tilt, right? So if I put my head down this way, or up this way, or like that, and like that, I'm moving my utricles and saccules around. And I'm moving those rocks around. And the rocks in my brain are shifting and giving my head, or my body, information. So... Tilting moves the gel and the stones. And the direction the stones move, which cells are getting fired, tells your body where your head is. Pretty useful. All right, last thing to talk about are the semicircular canals. You have three semicircular canals. Uh, so if you are looking at someone head on, uh, you will have, and then you say you're looking at someone from the side. And then maybe you're looking at someone straight down. This is a weird drawing. Here's some eyeballs. Okay. So. <sighs> Let's talk about the three semicircular canals. Drawing them is sort of odd. Uh, I'll have one like that. A little thing here. Um, one like uh, this. And then one kind of like this. Drawing them together sucks. So what I would like to do is draw them with regards to how, uh, which one's important based on which direction Gemma here is facing. So. Here's Jimmy's semicircular canals. Okay, there we go. 
semicircular canal is pretty easy to understand. So, you have a sort of hollow structure and this hollow structure right has hair cells in it amazingly enough those good old-fashioned hair cells again right and it's filled with a fluid. So we have our fluid inside. Fluid and hair cells. Now, if our fluid starts to move in one direction, it will cause hair cells to bend in the direction the fluid is moving. The fluid could also move the other direction. All right, so you get the idea. Fluid could move in either direction in my cell. If I move in one direction, the hair cells bend in the one direction. If I move in the other direction, the hair cells bend in the opposite direction. Because the fluid is pushing against the hairs. Alright, so you have three. They are filled with a gel, and we have hair cells, stereocilia cells, at the base. And the three semicircular canals detect rotation, right? So, if you have Jimmy here, and Jimmy starts to do cartwheels, right? Whee! He's doing some sweet cartwheels. All right? That is going to move his semicircular canal fluid. So we have that sideways semicircular canal, and we have a face forward semicircular canal, and we have a lateral semicircular canal, a horizontal, right? So we've got one like this, one like this, right? And then one like this, right? So if I'm doing cartwheels, my head is moving like this. So as our cartwheels rock on, this particular canal is going to have fluid moving through it and pushing hairs. And that's going to tell the body that it's doing cartwheels. Right? But say Jimmy likes to do front flips. Right? You do that. Right? There we go. Jump and tuck in for a flip. Whoa. All right, you are getting another type of rotation going on. So this here, my semicircular canal here is for cartwheels. Wow, that did not look good, but cartwheels. Here, we have flips, front flips or black back flips. 
front flip will move the fluid this way, back flip will move the fluid the other way. Either way, the fluid's getting moved and it's bending hairs. And finally, we have spinning. Right? So, spin. So, when you spin, the fluid moves. Right? Uh, fun note about spinning. Um, when you get going, you know, you get two or three good spins going and suddenly stop, the fluid is a fluid. It is still moving. And so, it's still causing those hair to bend. And so your brain is now fighting the information it's getting from the inner ear, which says you're still spinning, and the information you're getting from your eyes and body, which says I'm standing still, and you feel dizzy, which is kind of cool. In fact, it's actually true that you could counteract some of your dizziness by spinning in the opposite direction briefly. So if you do two or three spins, Maybe give one spin the opposite direction to try and slow the fluid movement in your semicircular canals. So that's pretty cool. Your semicircular canals, you have the cartwheel canals facing like this, so that when you cartwheel, the fluid moves. You have your flip canals, so when you flip, the fluid moves. And then you have your spinning canals so when you spin the fluid moves and tells you what's happening rotation pushes the gel the gel pushes the hairs and the bending hairs <coughs> give you the information about how you are moving so that's pretty sweet so let's do some ear pathologies uh, since we were primarily concerned with deafness, we'll talk about, uh, or since we were primarily concerned with hearing, we'll talk about different ways you can get deafness. Okay. Conduction deafness is one possibility. So in conduction deafness, basically there's a disorder of the pathway. Right, so of uh, sound conduction. What this means is that anything along the pathway could be damaged or missing. Right, you could have it missing from birth or you could have it damaged. So, could be the tympanic membrane could be the ossicles. Those are your most likely structures to be damaged or missing in sound conduction deafness. Right? Uh, so, this is actually something that is treatable. Uh, the sound can't reach the inner ear because there's damage or missing structures. Uh, but certain hearing aids can compensate for that because the whole point of the tympanic membrane and the ossicles is to amplify sound waves before they hit the oval window right so if you can put something on your ear that amplifies sound waves enough that they get to the oval window even without the tympanic membrane or the ossicles then good on you you've restored some hearing um, whether or not that's something you should do is up for other people to debate. This is just uh, pathologies and treatments. So uh, the sign of a conduction pathway deafness is pretty easy. It's damaged or missing structures. Uh, the symptom is um, deafness, uh, either um, moderate to severe or complete. Uh, if, in the case of missing structures, you're usually talking about complete deafness. Um, and the treatment can be as simple as hearing aids or, uh, Amer uh, or sign language. I don't think American Sign Language is the only sign language. So signing is also a treatment for deafness. 
Uh, then you have various ways you can have nerve problems. Um, so there, uh, when you look at the nervous pathway, right? So we have hair cells and they are connected up to some nerves and a bunch of those connect up and we get a larger cochlear nerve and then the cochlear nerve connects up to some other nerves from the vestibule right and then we get uh, a much larger nerve and this becomes the auditory nerve which goes to the brain so you've sort of got uh, multiple places where you can end up with nerve damage right the hair cells the cochlear slash vestibular nerve and the auditory nerve damage to any one of these can lead to hearing loss right so the tectorial membrane when it vibrates can actually vibrate at dangerous levels so normal vibration gives us a nice bent hair cell and a signal uh, but if the tectorial membrane starts to vibrate to dangerous levels, you can actually damage the hair cells. So here, we're just bending my hair cells and sending an impulse. Here, uh, we are getting uh, a stressed hair cell and you can cause them like if you get the tectorial membrane like if the tectorial membrane uh, vibrates uh, too intensely you can damage hairs on the hair cells right so basically damaged hair cells don't send impulses right uh, so here at hair cell damage you get loss of uh, tones right so where which hair cells get damaged determine which tones you can't hear anymore my mom can't hear high tones anymore uh, so she has a problem detecting high tones um, then when you get to the transmission nerves you're talking more like complete deafness. So, um, so for instance, if you have a break in the pathway here, that's going to be like total deafness. That's a, a nerve conduction break. And one thing you can do is get a cochlear implant this is conceptual man that is not at all what a cochlear implant looks like but a cochlear implant basically picks up information from one nerve and transfers it to the one past so it, it can help uh, keep the sound pathway going it, it basically uh, maintains sound conduction. Um, with hair cell damage, uh, you get a calibrated hearing aid.
and what that does um, is it basically for my mom who can't hear anything in the high pitches uh, when it detects high pitches it modulates them down to sound waves that she can detect better so the hearing aid takes in that sound and uh, because they did a full workup with her and determined where her sensitivities are, the hearing aid takes high pitches and turns them into lower pitches that she can hear. So hair cell stuff is a lot easier uh, because when you have that kind of deafness, it's usually not complete and total deafness. It's just deafness in certain ranges. And so a nicely calibrated hearing aid can take the sounds and translate them to ranges you can hear. When you have nerve conduction problems, then you need something like a implant that will transmit electrical information across the nerve conduction uh, failure or nerve conduction issue. So loudness equals damage to hairs because the tectorial membrane smashes them specific to the hertz of the sound that was loud enough to damage and hearing aids that take that uh, sounds at the levels where the cells were damaged and converts them to sounds tones that you can hear uh, so they are tuned to your own hearing loss profile but I think that's it